Let's try that. So I'm operating. Hello, friends. That's one of the beautiful things about the church is you're full of grace and you forgive people when they make mistakes and forget to do things. Uh, so as I was saying, I was here really early and all these Easter eggs that are around here, you know, this didn't just happen by chance. The Easter Bunny was here and we had a chance to sit down and have a little conversation. So I, I see this Easter Bunny. He's obviously leaving eggs all over the city of Stanton. And I look at this creature and he looks absolutely immaculate. His hair, his fur is so well kept. Like I can't even imagine. Like you have gone around the world hiding Easter eggs all night long. I asked him, how do you still look so good? He said, it's easy. I use hairspray. <laughs> okay, so, so then I asked him, you know, you've had a busy night. What do you do after this? After you've been going from city to city, hiding the eggs, he says, I like to go to my favorite restaurant for breakfast. And I asked Easter Bunny, what is your favorite restaurant? You know what he said? I hop. All right, all right, you've heard that. I know. <laughs> I know it's been 40 days since I told a joke at the beginning of a sermon, and those are the ones I came up with. <laughs> it is truly good to see you all this morning. I know that it was a challenge to get out of bed because probably like me, many of you stayed up way too late watching college basketball. And if you didn't, you missed a very good game. But this is the big one for us. This is our final four. This is our Super Bowl. Today is Easter Sunday. He is risen. He is risen I love this time of year. I love the spring. Anybody else love the spring? Yeah. I don't think I'm going out on a limb here. This is like one of the favorite times of the year because all at once things come alive again. All at once, the, the, like in February at first, you see the daffodils bursting forth from the, the hard soil. In a few weeks, you start to see birds returning. A few more weeks, and all at once, the grass is starting to turn green. The, the Bradford pears are starting to bloom. The red buds, as you look around us, start to put forth those red buds. How do they ever name those? I don't know. I love spring. You can count on these things year after year. These things happen. But I also realize spring is more than that. Spring is a time to start anew. It's time to change things up again. Those things that I was speaking of, those happen every year. The birds have come back every year of my life. No matter how far they go, they seem to always come back in the spring. The daffodils always come up in the spring. <laughs> But there's also a chance to do new things. I'm thinking this year, maybe, maybe I'll plant some geraniums in my flower bed. Maybe this year, this is the year that I'm going to plant some kale. Thank you for faking excitement over that. <laughs> Nobody's excited about kale, but this is the year I plant kale. What else can I do? This is the year that I start to mow my yard diagonally instead of... <laughs> I'll tell you the story about Caden and how she mows her lawn. <laughs> um, this is the year that I do things differently. Maybe this is the year that I join a golf league. What do you think about that? <laughs> Maybe this is the year that I take up tennis. This is an opportunity to start something new. Spring is not just about those reoccurring events, the perennial things that keep coming back year after year. Is it time to begin new things and i think that same thing is true about easter you know easter is this event that we get together for every every year we say the phrase you know the phrase now and it's very repetitive it can be the same thing year after year after year and a part of that i think is great i love tradition but easter can also be a chance to do something different easter can be a chance to do something new and I think Easter is intended to be something that we do better every year. So today, that's what I'm going to focus on. Easter as a chance to do better. So let's revisit that Easter story from 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, these women are going to the tomb early in the morning. And they arrive and they find that the stone has been rolled away. Now, they were going there for a very specific purpose. 
Just two days before they had seen their friend, their Lord, their Savior, Jesus, killed on the cross. He had stood up to the powers. He stood up to the religious authorities. He stood up to the governing authorities. They didn't like what he had to say, so they had him killed. These women knew the routine because this was not the first time that one of their friends had died. They'd experienced death before, and they know how to mourn the death of a friend, of a loved one. These things haven't changed over the years. What do you do when you lose a loved one? You get together with your friends. You get together with other people that cared about that person, and you share that experience. You share the hurt. You share the pain. And a part of the mourning process in the first century would have been to go to the tomb and to anoint the body. Now, we know today that if a person dies, we have these practices like embalming. What's the purpose of embalming? Keeps the dead body from stinking too much, right? <laughs> it's real scientific. I'm sure there's more science to it than that. But it keeps the body from stinking. Back then, they didn't have the wide practices of embalming. So it would have been the custom for people when they were mourning to go to the grave, to take anointing oils, to take fragrant herbs and spices and anoint that body so it stunk less, so others could come to the grave and they too could mourn the loss of a loved one. This is what the women were doing on that first Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago. We also know that back at the upper room, the disciples were gathered together. And we know from the scriptures, from the other gospels, that if we, we go on in the story, many of these disciples went back to their own jobs. Many of the disciples, what do you think of when you think of the disciples? Their jobs were fishermen. fishermen. There were a couple of fishermen in the group. We know in one of the gospels it says, after the resurrection of Jesus, these disciples were back out fishing. Maybe another disciple, the tax collector, Matthew, maybe he was out collecting taxes. These people were doing what was normal. They were anointing the body. They were mourning together. They went back to their jobs. They went back to what was normal. They went back to what was normal because normal is comforting. They went back to normal because normal is easy. So keep that in mind. They wanted things to be normal. All right, so let's jump ahead 2,000 years, and the date is April 4th, 2021. And I hear that word normal a lot. Not when, the, not when people are describing me, no. <laughs> I hear people that want to get back to normal. And I, for one, absolutely want to get back to normal. When I said about meeting in person, there was a round of applause from the congregation. Like, I, I'm not the only one here that wants to get back to meeting in person, am I? I'm not the only one that misses getting up, you know, going up to people and giving them hugs or shaking hands. I've, I've given too many, I've never before given the Easter chicken wing, but you know, first time for everything. I'm ready for that embrace. I'm ready to sing four part harmony to the best of my ability. And then I'm ready for the carrying meals. Can I get an amen? Easter Sunday morning, we used to, you know, we outdid ourselves every Easter. We had these carrying meals before our church service. I am so ready for that. We used to do this monthly gathering after church services where we sat down and people ate out of the same pot of food. Can you believe that? I am so ready for that. And it's not just the, East, the, the Sunday morning gatherings. I'm, I'm ready to see these people. I don't need that. That's okay. I will get it before it goes. I'm ready to meet inside where my notes don't blow away on a regular occasion. <laughs> I'm ready to do other things. I'm, I'm ready to go into your homes and visit with you. I, I've been visiting the same homes for the last couple of months. Uh, we've got our, our quarantine group. Um, I'm ready to see other people. Not that I'm not happy with those people that I've been meeting with. <laughs> but it's really good to meet other people and see other people too. I'm ready to go out to eat in a restaurant. The last time I got food from a restaurant, I ate my burrito in the parking lot in my car. The burrito was good, but let's be honest, the experience isn't quite the same. I'm ready to go to concerts, live concerts in the park. 
I'm ready to attend sporting events. <laughs> I'm ready for normal. And I don't think I'm the only one. But here's the thing. I'm not sure that we're called to normal. The disciples, when they returned to fishing, the women, when they went to the tomb to mourn, they were just doing what was normal. And often there's nothing wrong with normal. But I think the message of Easter is we're called to something better, something new. Think about this for a second. If someone were to ask you as a Christian, why did Jesus die on the cross? Most people would say, well, Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. I believe that's true. I don't think that's the whole truth. I think there's more to it. If I were to ask you, what is the most famous scripture in the Bible? Many people will come up with things like the Psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Other people might say the most famous passage in the Bible is, is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But actually, I think if you were to ask me what the most famous passage in the Bible is, I would say it's John 3.16. And I've got that one memorized in the King James Version. I'm that old. Should I do it? I don't know. You know this one. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you've ever watched a football game on TV, you see that guy with the crazy hair, the rainbow wig in the end zone, waving the sign, John 3, 16. Or remember, that's a part of a bigger story. When this Pharisee Nicodemus came to Jesus under the cover of the night because he was, he was almost embarrassed to go see him in front of his friends. And he asked Jesus questions about the kingdom of heaven, about the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells him, if you want to be a part of God's kingdom, you must be born again. Now, I know that phrase has been taken out of context and swooshed around and kind of dragged through the mud. And maybe it's a little bit overused. But if you really think about it, Jesus was saying, you get to start again. You have a new beginning in Christ. If you really want to be a part of my kingdom, you will experience this all anew. Jesus didn't say, I'll forgive you of your sins, and that's all you need to do. No, he says, I'm going to give you a new life. So why did Jesus die? I think it's more than just to forgive us of our sins. It's to give us a new beginning, a better beginning, a new existence. He didn't die so that we can get back to normal. So as we come out of the tomb of COVID-19, I think that we need to be challenged to do more than just get back to normal. We're thinking too small when we think we need to get back to normal. Because if we were really honest with ourselves, Normal wasn't that good. Now, for me, normal was pretty good. All right, I'll be honest. I, I have a, a roof over my head, clothes on my back, plenty of food in my closet. Food in my closet? <laughs> it's been a long, long year. <laughs> I hide snacks in my closet. Now you know. <laughs> Things aren't that bad for me. But remember that we as Christians are called to think about others as well. Maybe things, the normal, the new normal, could be better for those who are marginalized. I think about the, the, all the events of the last year, all the, the, the racial in, in the injustices that we've become more aware of. We see black and brown and white and yellow people fighting, hurting each other, intentionally hurting each other. And if you tell these people who are in minority status, we're going to get back to normal. Well, maybe for them, normal wasn't that good. And we look around us and all the poverty, the people that are suffering, sleeping in the streets. You know, in, in Matthew 25, Jesus tells us that anytime you care for the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, when you visit the people who are in prison, you're doing so to him. Well, for the hungry, normal isn't good. For the thirsty, normal isn't good. For those who are in prison, 
normal just isn't good enough. And as I thought about these people that, that for whom normal isn't good enough, I realized that for me, normal is not good enough. Because better is possible. I think about how much time I waste every day just staring at my phone. Yeah. I mean, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have imagined anybody ever saying that. I spend 20, you know, all these hours every day staring at my rotary phone. No, no, we wouldn't have done that. But now, hours every day wasted. And when I do that, I ignore the people right next to me. Yesterday, our neighbor of three years had a, a need. And she came over to our house. She needed some help. I realized that's the first time she's been inside our house. She's lived beside us for three years. When she needed our help, um, I had to use her name. Um, I, I had to go get her. I had to go pick up her groceries. I'll just give you the details. I wasn't going to give all the details. I had to go over to Kroger pick up her groceries uh, before six o'clock because they were closing for Easter, and she was making Easter and she couldn't Easter lunch and she couldn't find her car keys. She lost her phone and her car keys. You know how that is. You're you're totally lost. So she comes over and, and asks for some help. I didn't even know her last name. Like, how can I pick up your groceries if I don't have that information? I realized that normal isn't good enough. I grew up in rural Ohio. And it's been a long time since I've been home because of COVID-19. I haven't seen my, my parents. I haven't seen my niece and nephews for, for all this time. But every time that I go back to Ohio, let's be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit discouraged and depressed because this community that I grew up in is now this, this hotbed of drug abuse. We're talking about the hard stuff, meth and heroin. For the people that are dealing with drug addiction and alcoholism and other addictions, normal isn't good enough. Now, don't get me wrong, I realize that I am blessed. Like I said, I've got food in my closet at home. <laughs> Not everybody can say that. I am thankful for all that I have, and for me, normal was pretty good. But we're not called to normal. We're not called to pretty good. When those women showed up at the tomb 2,000 years ago, they were expecting normal. When the disciples went back to fishing and collecting taxes, they too were expecting normal. But when they showed up at that tomb, anything but normal happened. The tomb was empty because that man who they saw killed on that cross just two days earlier stood up and walked out on his own two feet. And let me tell you what, folks, I'm no medical doctor, but that's not normal. <laughs> we Christians are not called to be normal. <laughs> we don't believe normal things. No, we believe in miracles. We believe in a resurrection. The tomb was empty. The one laid there walked out on his own two feet. We are called to move beyond what is normal. And I found this quote by Esau McCulley. He's a New Testament scholar at Wheaton College. And he says this, as we, as we leave the tombs of quarantine, and return to normal. I'm going to try that again. I'm going to slow down and read it and actually use his words. <laughs> As we leave the tombs of quarantine, a return to normal would be a disaster unless we recognize that we are going back to a world desperately in need of healing. For me, the source of that healing is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. The work that Jesus left his followers to do includes showing compassion and forgiveness and contending for a just society. It involves the ever-present offer for all to begin again. The weight of this work fills me with a terrifying fear, especially in light of all those who have done great evil in his name. Who is worthy of such a task? Like the women, the scope of it leaves me to often end in a stunned silence. My friends, I'm ready for normal. Normal was comfortable. Normal was easy. But we are called to be abnormal. We are followers of the one 
who arose from the grave, the one that called us to love our neighbors, to love our God, and to serve both. Christ calls us not to normal. Christ calls us to something better. Christ calls us to himself. So I'm going to invite...